I'm MK Jesse. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about degeneric imaging as a uh, adjunct to Dr. Kajowski's lecture and a precursor to um, Dr. Mosier's lecture. Uh, sorry if there's any discrepancy in the um, online syllabus. I have no disclosures. So in our institution, we perform a lot of degeneric imaging, and we perform this degeneric imaging for actual clinical purposes. Um, so I know how, how it feels to have those uh, clinicians coming up to you asking you about a new technique. We had this before we started doing this, orthopedic surgeons and the sports medicine docs would come in and ask us routinely, you know, what is, what is the Gemmerich? How can we use it? How does it work? And is it any good? So um, my purpose then is really geared to the musculoskeletal radiologist and the general radiologist who want some answers uh, for their orthopedic surgeons when they're asked about this. So of course, just to begin, we do have to go through some of the normal um, cartilage anatomy and cartilage imaging techniques, and then we'll get into Degemeric and exactly what it is, how it works, what are the methods, and what are the techniques. And then we'll get into the literature on Degemeric and the current applications, specifically as they pertain to the hip and as they pertain to follow up on autolog autologous cartilage implants. And then finally, we'll talk about pitfalls and limitations of the technique. So what is cartilage? As we all, I'm sure, are aware, cartilage is a rigid connective tissue structure that lines the joints of the body, and it aids in that fluid motion and shock absorption. So um, cartilage is made up of collagen and elastic fibers that lie around a very gelatinous, very spongy, central extracellular matrix, which is predominantly water with interspersed proteoglycans and glyco uh, glycosaminoglycan particles. So it's very important to understand what a proteoglycan is. Just for review, this is a core protein that has multiple branching negatively charged glycosaminoglycan particles coming off of that. So what is the importance of imaging? Well, uh, up until now, imaging is really for the detection and grading of cartilage damage and the, the uh, determination of acute versus chronic cartilage injury. As far as that cartilage softening, that very microscopic or histiologic breakdown, that's something that really has not been available to us by imaging until we um, developed these advanced cartilage imaging techniques. So what we have available to us now is CT arthrography, which is generally reserved for patients who can't undergo a um, conventional MRI. The conventional MRI right now is our gold standard. It's a non-invasive technique. It provides excellent cartilage and soft tissue contrast. We've got great visualization of that intermediate signal in the glycosaminoglycan layer. We've got a nice dark underlying subchondral bone plate and a nice dark overlying lamina splendens. And our routine imaging is typically composed of proton density, uh, fat saturation, and non-fat saturation images, with or without the addition of some 3D imaging, as Dr. Kajowski talked about. So currently, most of us use a staging that was uh, presented by Dr. Audie in 1969 that had to do with the morphologic evaluation of the cartilage, so normal being grade zero, two being cartilage fissures that were less than 50%, and four being complete cartilage loss. And we have very good sensitivity of detecting these. As you can see on our routine uh, MRI, we've got, we can see this, this irregularity of the cartilage in grade two. We can see a grade three delaminating fissure and full thickness cartilage defects, obviously very easy to detect on routine MR. So our CT arthrography and our conventional MR are great for detecting these grade two, three, and four cartilage defects. But what about our grade one and our pre-grade one? That's where our advanced cartilage imaging comes into play. So advanced cartilage imaging is sometimes called physiologic imaging or histiologic imaging because it is based on those uh, small microscopic particles in the cartilage. So cartilage is this avascular tissue composed of, of the components that we've talked about. And osteoarthrosis, when it's very early, involves breakdown of these proteoglycan molecules and the glycosaminoglycan molecules, allowing for increased water to flow into the extracellular matrix, which is the basis of our advanced cartilage imaging. So in generalized term, we have degemeric T2 mapping and T1 row. I'm going to focus on degemeric. Um, that's used, again, in the grade 1 and pre-grade 1 cartilage damage, and predominantly for pre-surgical planning, which we'll get into in detail. So I'm going to give you a, uh, a very simplified version of how exactly this works. Um, the degeneric imaging is slightly more invasive in that it does require a peripheral IV, and it does require you to exercise the joint for about 10 to 30 minutes after the injection. 
So this is a uh, cartoon or a um, diagram of normal cartilage where we have the synovial fluid and the cartilage layer that's filled with these branching negatively charged glycosaminoglycan particles. So what we're going to do is we're going to inject the patient um, intravenously with negatively charged gadolinium. That gadolinium is then going to flow into the synovial space via indirect arthrography. And it's being repelled by all those negative charges on the glycosaminoglycan particles, allowing for only a few ions of gadolinium to seep into the cartilage. This as opposed to abnormal cartilage, so cartilage with early glycosaminoglycan breakdown. Uh, what we see is, again, after we inject that gadolinium and it flows into that synovial space, we have less of the negative charge that's repelling the gadolinium particles, and we have more gadolinium that's flowing into the cartilage. So how does this then become a degeneric value or something that we can work with? Well, when the negative charge GAGs break down, again, it allows for gadolinium to seep into the cartilage, and our degeneric index is based on T1 relaxation times. So the shorter T1 relaxation time means more gadolinium, means more severe cartilage breakdown. So our degeneric index is exactly the T1 relaxation time, so normal being higher generally considered greater than 500 milliseconds, and abnormal being lower, generally considering, considered less than 400 milliseconds. So there are many different protocols for degeneric, and, and they vary quite a bit based on the, the machine that you're using and what, uh, what kind of time you have to actually prepare your degeneric images. So Bashir et al. In, wrote multiple articles on some potential protocols. Bernstein et al. in Magnetic Resonance in Medicine in 2001 expanded on that. And she stated that, uh, or confirmed that it can be performed at both 1.5 T and 3 T. It does require a double injection of gadolinium, which amounts to about 0.4 milliliters per kilogram. And it's generally accepted that an intravenous administration of gadolinium is favored over intraarticular. One, it's safer you don't have the risk of infection, but also it provides a better standardization of your T1 values, and that was proven by Zilkins in the um, Journal of MRI in 2014. So after we perform the injection, the patient does have to exercise the joint, and that can either be if you're working with the knee, flexion and extension, or a lot of times it's just having the patient walk on a treadmill for about 10 to 30 minutes. The knee joint is imaged in about two to four hours because it does have thicker cartilage. The hip is imaged a little bit faster at 1 to 1.5 hours. If you look at the literature, you'll see that the maximum concentration of gadolinium in the hip cartilage is 90 to 120 minutes, but we image at roughly 60 minutes, and that's because of the potential for washout and abnormal cartilage. So you don't want to sacrifice your sensitivity by imaging the joint too late. So we generally accept that these joints should be imaged at about 60 minutes. So again, the protocol is, is fairly variable. In our institution, we use a 3D uh, flip angle technique. Um, these are gradient um, images, and we perform flip angles at, at 6 and 32. Again, this is going to be very variable based on the machine you're using. Those flip um, gradient images are then used to make our T1 cartilage map, and it's on this map that we can draw our regions of interest. And in the hip, we draw a region of interest that encompasses both the femoral and the acetabular cartilage together, because if anybody has actually tried to draw these, it's extremely hard to try and differentiate these two layers of cartilage, and so this is a fairly accepted way to perform this, uh, this ROI. So after we draw the ROI over the femoral and the acetabular cartilage, we get a mean T1 relaxation time, in this case, 414 milliseconds. So the success of degeneric in determining cartilage damage has been verified in both in vivo and ex vivo studies of the hip and of the knee, and further veri verified by histiologically controlled studies, and that was Zilkins and uh, Bittershaw, who looked at the degeneric values in cartilage and then performed histiologic uh, or made histiologic specimens of that cartilage and found a great correlation between what they're seeing histiologically and what we're seeing by degeneric. And it actually has been shown to have good intra and inter observer variability using these well researched ROI techniques. So let's move on to some of the clinical applications of degeneric. So the clinical applications are largely academic with the intention to better understand patterns of progression of cartilage wear in various clinical scenarios. Where degeneric has been 
best validated and is probably utilized the most is in the hip. And the reason is because of the increased use and the increased complexity of hip preservation surgery. So we're talking about patients who are undergoing periacetabular osteotomies, derotational femoral osteotomies, big, big surgeries. And what you don't want to do is have these patients undergo this kind of surgery when they're ultimately just going to break down their cartilage. So applications in the hip are largely um, these four different uh, disease entities, and we'll talk about each one of those separately. In developmental dysplasia of the hip, this is a condition that's relatively common amongst children, adolescents, and adults, and it is basically a hypoplasia of the acetabulum that causes a femoral head undercoverage and leads to subsequent femoral head subluxation and subsequent osteoarthrosis. And it's thought that DDH actually accounts for about 20 to 40 percent of the arthroplasty is performed. So it's a big, big problem, and that, that accounts for the increase in the hip preservation surgery to try and prevent this early OA in these patients. So Kim et al. initially investigated the use of degeneric in patients with DDH. He looked at 67 hips and measured the degeneric score and also the joint space width and compared that to the radiographic and clinical relevant factors of pain and lateral center edge angle. And what he found was that the degeneric values correlated significantly with pain in LCE as a measure of severity of dysplasia, whereas the joint space, space width did not. So he found that the lower degeneric scores were associated with more pain and were associated with a lower LCE angle. So therefore, he concluded that the degeneric was really a more sensitive examination to assess the severity of the dysplasia, where joint space width really had no correlation whatsoever. So where we can really start applying this in a clinical setting is when we're talking about Bernie's periacetabular osteotomies. So in um, just as a, as a brief review for anybody who doesn't know, this periacetabular osteotomy is an open surgical procedure to correct femoral head under coverage in DDH, and it requires three distinct osteotomies, one in that supraacetabular region of the iliac bone, one in the superior pubic ramus, and one in the anterior ischium. And what this does is it frees up the acetabulum so that that can then be rotated into a more morphologically normal orientation with increased femoral head coverage. So Cunningham et al. In, uh, in the JBS journal in 2006 looked at 124 hips and measured the pre-procedural degeneric index, correlating that with the probability of failed PAO. Uh, patients were considered to have failed their PAO if they progressed to arthroplasty, if they had increased pain or increased joint space narrowing. And what he found was very interesting, and that was that there was a statistically significant increased failure rate if the degeneric index was less than 390 milliseconds. And this was an example from his paper where he had a patient who had bilateral hip dysplasia who underwent pre-procedural degeneric and showed a clear uh, difference between the two sides which, with much less uh, glycosaminoglycan content on that right side. This patient then underwent bilateral periacetabular osteotomies, and you can probably conclude by the last image that that right side then subsequently failed, and the left side was looking pretty normal. And this was just a graph showing those exact same results where patients who had satisfactory results after a PAO had higher degeneric values around 500, whereas the early failures after PAO had a lower degeneric of about 350. And that was, again, um, corroborated by Kim, who again showed that there was an increased failure rate, rate in patients who had lower degeneric, again, right around, you see that super sharp, steep increase in that probability of failure of PAO right around that sweet spot of 380 to 390 milliseconds. And what he also stated was that the anterior joint space uh, in these dysplastic patients was really the better, the better spot to measure these. It was more sensitive area um, for cartilage damage and may better predict premature joint failure than even the coronal images. So performing those degeneric um, images in a sagittal plane is actually recommended and is something that we do in our institution as well. So Hingsammer and also in the JBS, JBJS journal also um, looked at DDH patients, but he looked at 
uh, patients who were post-PAO one and two years after the procedure. And he also found something interesting, and that was that patients' degemeric scores actually improved after their PAOs. So suggesting that there was a post-procedural alteration in mechanics and offloading of that hip cartilage that then alters the cartilage matrix and allows for healing of that cartilage, which has promising results in the follow-up of these patients. So you may have these patients who have undergone PAO do a one or two year post-procedural degemeric, look at what that degemeric value is doing, and if it, if it hasn't improved or even worse, um, if it's getting lower, you may suggest that maybe the mechanics and the offloading of the hip joint are not fully mechanical quite yet. So degemeric has also been studied in femoral acetabular impingement, which, as we know from the morning lectures, is cam, pincer, and mixed type. It's a fairly common um, condition in both males and females, and it has a well-established association with cartilage damage and early osteoarthrosis. And the reason is because of this. In our cam, our cam bump impacts this peripheral aspect of the acetabular cartilage and causes a shearing effect of that cartilage, leading to osteoarthrosis. And then the pincer... Similarly, but slightly different, you get impaction of the femoral neck by that hypertrophied acetabular rim. You get subluxation of the femoral head, and then you get a more global cartilage damage in these pincer patients. So degemeric imaging has been shown to identify early cartilage damage that correlates with the pain and correlates with the severity or the, how high your alpha angles are, and that's been shown by, in multiple studies. What Mamish et al. also showed was that um, these patients have a very distinct zonal distribution of cartilage damage. So patients with CAM have more cartilage damage than in the anterior peripheral joint space as opposed to the central joint space, and pincer have a more global distribution. And this is important when you're drawing your ROIs to know exactly where to draw them based on the, the patient that you're evaluating. And just briefly, there's uh, been a couple of studies that have looked at ways to improve our sensitivity in detecting cartilage damage in FAI. One is uh, radial imaging. That's the one I'll talk about. That was by Domeyer in the Core Journal in 2010. And again, that's because of the improved profiling of that anterior peripheral cartilage. So degemeric has also been studied in slipped capital femoral epiphysis and leg cap perthes disease. The Skiffy uh, study was by Zilkins looking at 32 hips after Skiffy pinning. And what he found was that there was a difference in degemeric index between patients with post-pinning normal morphology, so an alpha angle of less than 50, and severe deformity or an alpha angle greater than 50, which is not too surprising based on what we already know about CAM lesions. In leg cap perthes disease, uh, which is an AVN of the femoral head that leads to deformity, poor joint congruence, and subsequent osteoarthrosis, these patients can be treated with fairly extensive osteotomies of the proximal femur and the acetabulum, and it's been shown by Millis in the Core Journal in 2002 that a major factor in the failure of these osteotomies is the extent of pre-existing cartilage damage. So Zilkins, again, looked at 31 hips with LCPD with the normal contralateral hip as a control and showed sig significant differences in the diseased hips and the uh, normal control hips, specifically with regard to the medial cartilage. So again, a little bit different in the distribution. So if you're studying patients with LCPD, you want to draw your ROI slightly more medial as opposed to our CAM, which we've already talked about. So although we know this, there really have not been studies that are evaluating the risk of failure or progression of osteoarthrosis following LCPD osteotomy based on the preoperative degemeric, but this is something that's likely on the horizon. So as far as clinical applications of degemeric in the knee, there really are not that many. And, and the reason probably is because our preservation surgeries that we're doing in the knee are really not as extensive as in the hip. Where degemeric has been shown promising in the knee is when trying to detect the health and repair of the autologous cartilage implants. So Gillis in 2001 initially looked at this and he, he measured the degemeric value within these implants uh, at two months, six months, and out to about two years after the implant. And you can see by the color images that there was significantly decreased glycosaminoglycan content initially in these implants, which was shown in his graph as well. But what was very interesting about this is that the degemeric value or the glycosaminoglycan content within these autolog autologous cartilage implants increased over the course of two years. 
And that's something that has been shown repeatedly in multiple, multiple studies that about a year and beyond, this cartilage in the implant actually becomes more normal in composition, really comparable to the adjacent cartilage right next door. So this is a, a potential way to follow up these implants if you have a patient who maybe isn't doing too well, um, or you have some concern about the um, incorporation or the health of the cartilage implant, you can put them through a degenerate scan. You can measure the degenerate, and if it's, it's significantly lower in the implant than it is in the adjacent cartilage, and they're greater than a year out, you may question whether or not that cartilage implant is actually healthy and undergoing the appropriate repair. So uh, kind of at the end of the talk, I want to talk about some potential pitfalls. So things to watch out for if you decide to start performing degemeric in your institution. One is dosing. So it's been suggested um, and, uh, and really evaluated in quite extensively by Tiderius whether or not BMI has an effect on the dosing in degemeric. And he found that actually, in fact, it did. So he showed that there was an increase in in plasma gadolinium concentration in obese patients. And that was because a, or due to a decrease in extracellular water and adipose tissue. So if you, you can see on the graph here that um, that plasma gadolinium concentration increased as BMI went up. And he noted that the plasma concentrations would increase up, up to about 1.4% if the BMI was greater than 45. And that translated to a bias in degeneric of up to 20%, which is significant. And what he did was he provided for us additionally a very simple way to correct for this. So um, he provided a formula that was T1 corrected equals T1 measured plus three times the BMI minus 20. So if you're doing these degeneric scans on a larger patient, you may just want to apply this fairly simple formula to get a more accurate T1 value and not basically overcall cartilage damage in these larger patients. Another potential pitfall is the standardization of T1 values. So all over the literature, again, there's question of reliability of the T1 gadolinium values based on a, or given a person-to-person -person variability in intrinsic T1 of the cartilage, or T1 naught. So Williams in 2007 actually addressed this again very beautifully where he measured a T1 corrected based on the T1 gadolinium, um, or the post T1 values, and with uh, uh, basically taking into account the pre-gadolinium T1 intrinsic value of the cartilage and found that really that T1 naught was very constant or negligible at both 1.5T and 3T. So it's probably something we can now put to rest. The one time that you're going to have to take this into consideration and consider doing a pre-contrast T1 value is when you're assessing non-native cartilage and cartilage uh, transplant or cartilage implant patients. Another poten um, potential pitfall is B1 inhomogeneity. And just suffice it to say that when you're, if you decide to use a 3D variable flip angle gradient echo technique, which is what we use in our institution, it's fine if you're going to perform this at a 1.5T. If you move this up to a 3T, then you start getting um, a lot of sensitivity um, and field in inhomogeneities within your region of interest. So you can do it. Um, and it's nice because it's a fast way to do it, but you have to really tweak your protocol to make sure that you're not, um, it, make sure that you're taking into account these inhomogeneities and you're actually getting uh, very accurate readings. So um, there, is a, there is a paper in Magnetic Resonance in Me Medicine in 2011 that did pr propose a new high resolution T2, uh, 2D T1 mapping saturation recovery pulse sequence for degemeric. And it was interesting because this was actually found to be fairly insensitive to this B1 variation as large as 20%. Um, so that might be an alternative as well. Um, and lastly, I want to give you a little bit of anecdotal um, information as well. So again, we do a fairly large amount of degemeric um, for patients with DDH and femoral acetabular impingement at our institution. And I want to uh, warn everybody that a normal degemeric value does not mean normal cartilage. And it's something that you should be sure to relay to your surgeons that this is a possibility because they can get very angry um, and very frustrated when they go in and they see these cartilage lesions. So how does this happen? Well, in 
a CAM FAI patient, they are predisposed to something called a bubble lesion. And I'm going to explain to you what that is. So when you have a CAM, you have this bump that again impacts that peripheral acetabular cartilage, and it acts like if you're pushing a rug on a, on a hardwood floor. It pulls off the cartilage from that subchondral bone plate and makes a, a bubble um, with intact cartilage overlying it. So when this patient goes back into extension, this will flop back into a normal position. It's going to be completely occult on your MRI, and this cartilage is going to have still maintained its normal glycosaminoglycan content. So your degemeric is going to be normal, and I'll show you an example. So this was a patient who underwent a pre-surgical MRI, um, was known to have CAM and a little bit of mixed type femorostabular impingement. The MRI, in the, on the MRI, the cartilage looked completely pristine. The only indication we had that there was any kind of issue was there was a little bit of edema in that supraacetabular region, but otherwise everything looked fine and dandy. Then we performed a degemeric on this patient, and all throughout the weight-bearing zones, the degemeric was in completely normal range. So this was just one slice where it was 547, so, so well and normal and good. This patient then went on to a scope, and this is what our orthopedic surgeon found. Right here, you can see there's that very bubbly, very blottable area of cartilage that otherwise looks completely normal. And all of our evaluations showed that this was completely normal. But, uh, but it was completely dissociated from the underlying subchondral bone plate. A similar type lesion can occur in DDH. Um, this is what we call an in to out lesion. And this is a cartilage shearing that happens as a, basically as a result of these abnormal stresses uh, that are caused from that medial to lateral subluxation of the femoral head. So as that femoral head slides outwardly, it can kind of get stuck on that cartilage and pull that cartilage off with it, creating a delaminating fissure of relatively normal cartilage. So again, when this patient gets put in the MRI, they extend their leg. This can flop back into a normal location and be completely occult. So here is this example. So patient with developmental dysplasia, you can see this hypertrophy labrum and a truncated acetabular rim. Um, we have a subchondral cyst, which is the only indication that maybe there's something going on. But as far as the cartilage itself, I don't think anybody would call a full thickness defect or even any major fissuring happening here. And our degemeric agreed with us. Um, our degemeric values were 572, um, or fairly equivalent throughout the weight-bearing portion of this patient's hip. On scope, though, however, this patient, this is the medial aspect of the joint space. You can see there's this in-to-out huge cartilage flap, full thickness cartilage flap in this patient who is being considered for a periacetabular osteotomy. So if this patient was not scoped first, they just went on to have their surgery, this would be a major problem. So this patient had to be debrided. They had to undergo Microfracture, this is actually a label repair in them as well, I apologize. Um, but uh, they basically had to postpone their PAO because of that, that cartilage lesion. So I'm going to conclude um, with just a summary. Basically, we've talked about the pathophysiology behind degemeric imaging. We've talked about the current literature and the current applications, namely pre-surgical assessment in patients undergoing periacetabular osteotomy and follow-up in patients who have undergone cartilage implant are the two most widely researched and most accepted clinical applications. And then potential pitfalls being T1 standardization, gadolinium dosing, and cartilage lesions happening in patients with normal degemeric indices. So I hope with this talk you have gotten a general idea of what degemeric imaging is. If anybody comes up and asks you about it, you'll at least have some information to give them. And you can apply some of these um, potential clinical applications to your practice and potentially start using this in the future. Thank you.